characters this time because they have some <coughs> things in common, and I didn't know we'd have enough material just with the one. So let's go ahead and bow for a word of prayer. Our great God, we are so thankful that you love us, that you care for us, you watch out for us every day. We're thankful for your word. We thank you for all these amazing real life stories that we have in your word that we can learn from, we can apply to our lives. We can see what pleases you, what makes you happy, so we can emulate those things, and we can see what displeases you, and we can avoid those things. We thank you for the simplicity of your word and how it is powerful enough, not just for us to understand it, but for it to change our lives. Help us this uh, evening as we study together that we'll have good open hearts and that we'll search your word for the truth that is in it in our lives. Through Jesus we pray. Amen. All right. I need a couple of guys who will get the microphones. I don't think anybody has microphones. They should be in the back room back there. All right, so Exodus chapter 1. Actually, this story starts hundreds of years prior because it starts with them coming into Egypt. And it gives us an accounting of how many people actually came down to Egypt, about 70. Joseph, of course, was already there. As they get there, God prospers them. They have one of the best places in town, the land of Goshen. Everything is going well. Joseph is the second highest person in charge. And then he dies. All of his brothers die. And then hundreds of years later, a new pharaoh rises, probably an entirely different dynasty. And he doesn't even remember anything about Joseph. He doesn't have a good spot in his heart for Joseph, forgot about all the great things Joseph did. And he looks around and he sees all these foreigners and how fast they are growing. And of course, we know that this is the fulfillment of a promise God made to Abraham that he would have a big family. And so God is fulfilling that promise while they're in Egypt. Well, he doesn't like that very much. And so he starts working them really hard, hoping that this hard work, this hard labor would cause a lot of distress on them and they would stop growing so fast as well as get the cities that he wants built, built. Well, that doesn't work very well because they continue to grow. More children are being born, and he's in fear of them, as all the other Egyptians are as well. So finally, he calls Shapira, Shapura, and Pua in, the midwives of the Hebrews. And he says to them, I want you, as you deliver these babies for the Hebrews, if it's a boy, I want you to kill him. Now, this was probably something that was going to happen in secret. It was going to be disguised somehow just as a way of childbirth, and it just, unfortunately, it was a bad childbirth. Because if you have this reputation going forward, it was going to cause a lot of chaos. That was the original plan. Well, these two ladies got this order from Pharaoh, and this is a really terrible order, and they realized they can't do this. And so they let the boy children live out of their fear for God. They're called into the office or to the throne room, right? And in front of Pharaoh, he asked him, why are you not doing what I told you to do? And they said, the Hebrew women are lively in their childbirth. They don't give birth like the Egyptians. They don't wait long enough to call for a midwife to come and to have us help deliver. So the baby's already born. The mother's already holding the baby, whatever the case may be. They, we can't do anything in secret here. So that's why it's not working out. God blesses them for this. And he says he gives them households or families. So great blessing that these women get because they do this. Well, Pharaoh's not deterred. So what he does now is he goes to his own people, the, the, the other Egyptians, and he says, when an Israelite woman or a Hebrew woman gives birth and it's a boy, kill it. If it's a girl, let that girl live. And that sets the stage for great Moses being born in the next chapter, right, with everything that goes on there. But we're going to have to stop our story on this particular occasion. It is a fascinating story, and these two women, although they only get a couple verses, they are definitely heroes, and they are minor characters that teach us major lessons, and we'll talk about some of those lessons in a little while. Well, years later, you have another story that comes up that I think is similar in at least a couple ways. God's people, Jehoshaphat was a good king, and he was doing great things. He, he, God was uh, with him. He did some things. He had some alliances with Ahab that God wasn't uh, fond of. 
But he knew that his heart was good. As a matter of fact, one of the great statements in the Bible is God sends a prophet to him and says, you should have done what you did, but I see good in you. And so Jehoshaphat was a good king. Well, his son, not so much. He gives the kingdom to his oldest son, and he goes about and he kills his brothers because he doesn't want anybody to have the throne. When his son takes uh, the kingship, an enemy comes and kills all the, his family. So they're down to just one. And then when he dies, his mother, Athaliah, kills everybody else just about that she could think of that might have a claim to the throne. She has them all ki killed. Well, Jehoshabeth, which is Athaliah's daughter, and Ahaz's sister, she goes and finds the one heir that's probably less than a year old, Joash, a baby, still nursing, takes that baby into the temple, her husband is the priest, and they hide that child for seven years there in the temple until finally they make a plan to bring him out, set him up as, him up as king. And you probably remember the story. Athaliah comes in there and says, treason, treason, treason. And they're like, no, 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 the treason's on you. And he had all this great plan set up, and it ends up they take her out of the city, they kill her, and it, the people rejoice. Now, when her son died, the people didn't mourn. When she dies, they rejoice. So now you have another example of a lady who is face to face with a decision. Do I allow this, my mother, this wicked, evil woman that's killing everybody, do I allow her to go ahead and kill this little child, or do I take this child and hide this child? And she chooses to hide the child. And then the other example is in the time of Ahab. And although children are not involved here, remember when Elijah comes to present himself to Ahab, it's been a famine in the land for three years, and he tells Obadiah, hey, I want to, to go see Ahab. Tell Ahab I'm here. And Obadiah, of course, is like, oh, what have I done that you hate me so much? You know, haven't you heard that I've done some wonderful things? I have hidden a hundred prophets, 50 in a cave, and I take them bread and water because Jezebel has killed all the prophets of God. So these hundred are alive because of my efforts. If you tell me to go get the king, the Spirit of the Lord is going to take you away from me. When the Spirit of the Lord takes you away, I'm going to come back. I'm going to bring Ahab and say, there he is, and you're not going to be there. And Ahab has gone over the, his entire kingdom, has gone over to all the neighboring kingdoms, and he has not left any stone unturned to try to find you. As a matter of fact, he makes people swear to him that they haven't seen you. So my life is in jeopardy. Of course, Elijah says, no, I'm going to come, and I'm going to appear before the king today. And so he goes and gets the king, and they come back, and that's what leads into another amazing story, and that is the victory at Mount Carmel. But you have this guy, doesn't get a lot of attention, doesn't get a lot of notoriety, but yet he saved a hundred people's lives, prophets of God, when this evil woman was trying to kill all of them. So those are the three stories that we're going to talk about today and hopefully learn some good lessons from. I want to give you some interesting information, at least I find it interesting, a little bit on all three of these stories, especially the first one. There is not a consensus on whether these women were Hebrews or Egyptians. It could be that they were Egyptians and they were just in charge of the Hebrew women and giving birth to them. They do have Egyptian names. One argument that I heard for that was simply that Pharaoh probably would not have put it on someone who was a Hebrew to kill Hebrew babies. So if she was an Egyptian and Pharaoh says, kill the Hebrew babies, that would probably make a little more sense. So we don't know whether or not they were Hebrews or they were just over the Hebrew women as their midwives. Some suggest, and this is sort of goes both ways, some suggest that there would have been a bunch of midwives in Israel because they're, they're having kids like crazy, right? And so two would probably not be enough. So they might have just been in charge. They might have been the two that were in charge of the midwives. They could have been the teachers, the educators of the midwives, just over everything. That's why they were the ones called before Pharaoh. The, and and we, I want to talk about this briefly. What was the excuse they gave to Pharaoh and why they didn't kill the babies? Yeah. 
No, no one wants to say it. All right, they're just going to say it. Okay. Yeah, they, before we get there, they already delivered the baby, so we, can't, we couldn't do this. Truth or a lie? <laughs> All right, we have some people who have to. Uh, Mary, Mary has a comment. Debbie has another comment again. Um, so, truth or a lie? Because this is a lot of this. This gets a lot of attention. This, along with other stories that are similar to this, gets a lot of attention. I think it's worth at least pointing out. Go ahead, Mary. Well, one commentary I read said that that in general maybe it was true, you know, and they just stated the generality, but didn't add that, you know. Not all of them were like that, so they withheld information rather than lied, or the fact that they were doing it to save lives. Okay, you know. so the idea is that the statement itself could have been true, but what was his question? Why, do you Why didn't you do it? Why didn't you kill him? Is that total truth? Is that 100% the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth? No, it's not because they didn't do it because God gives the reason. It's in the text why they didn't do it, because they feared God. Right, Debbie? Well, I'm thinking because the, um, the, the Hebrews were worked so hard and, you know, they were under forced labor for years. They were out building the cities for, for the Pharaoh. So these people were working hard. I mean, they were distressed and crying out to the Lord, but they were... <laughs> Whether or not they came home tired, they were still producing more babies. So I think <laughs> that my impression is they were pretty strong for the task. Okay. All right. So I, I think that I'm glad you brought that up and I didn't have to. Uh, you know, the, the one rule of thinking is that they were in better shape, right? Because of the physical demands of working in the fields and all the hard labor there. One commentator I read just stated as a fact, this is what happens if you're in uh, women who do physical labor, they have their babies quicker and they come back to work faster than those who don't. The Egyptian ladies uh, would probably not have done a lot of physical labor because they had slaves to do that for them. Whether or not that is true or not, I don't know. But it is worth considering that it pro it, it, there's a good chance that this was true, that the, the, the Hebrew women delivered faster than the Egyptian women, either by God's providence or by just the natural case of being in good shape with physical labor. Savannah? In verse 17, in 16, he said, I want you to kill all the babies. In 17, it said, but the midwives feared God and did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them, but saved the male children alive. So the Bible says that they saved them. They didn't kill them. They definitely saved them and didn't, didn't kill them. And they probably had opportunity to save them. Uh, and uh, the reason they did it was not because they delivered too quickly. The reason they didn't is because they feared God, right? If, if it was just because they delivered too quickly for the midwives to get there, what, why should they get all these blessings that God has given them, right? So they're doing it because of that. So, all right, we'll let Gail go, and then we'll sum up. Mine's very similar to what she said, but the fact that they let the babies live meant that they were there with the women at the point of delivery. It wasn't that, oh, well, we couldn't make it in time because they're so strong. They gave birth before we even arrived. Okay. At, at best, I think at worst, it's a flat out lie, right? Just a flat out lie. At best, it's a true statement meant to hide the, hide the fact. I, I guess that's where I am. I mean, it's a true statement, but it wasn't giving all the information because there's fear here. As, as we think about these people that they're, the, all three of these people are answered to, there's a lot of reason to be afraid on this particular occasion. Uh, the interesting thing about Jehoshaphat is that God's people have had three generations now where they haven't had very many people ready to take on the, the lineage, right? And so that's how bad it had gotten, hang them by a thread, it's sometimes how we think about it. We know that with God, it's never hanging by a thread, right? God's always in control and in charge. But from a human standpoint, it really looks like what she did was very, very important because of the fact that they were uh, about to end the lineage of David and be, God being able to keep that promise at least directly the way in the line that he was. All right, so let's go to question number one. What life experience do you think helped these three minor characters to be able to teach us such major lessons. What, in other words, we've talked about this. These people don't just drop in God's story without a past. 
there has to be something in their life or some things in their life that we might be able to pick up on to see why they were up to the task. Were there probably a lot of people that wouldn't be up to the task? The task? Absolutely. So what made these people up for the task? We start with the midwives. Any, any ideas of what made these women able to do it? Brian has one. So you were asking whether they're Hebrews or Egyptians. So I guess a couple of theories. If they're Hebrews, then maybe they would have known about what God did for Joseph and the Israelites and exalting them to Egypt and providing for them. And so they would have that interest, like you said, in preserving the seed promises to Abraham. Uh, if they're Egyptians, it could just be they just felt sorry for these Hebrews looking at all the slavery they had to do. And, you know, now they've they got a hit out on their life on killing their, their children. And they just felt sympathy. Okay. Could be sympathy for the women who were having their children uh, killed even though they were working so hard. Angie? Oh, I just also wanted to say that obviously they knew who God was. So somewhere in their past, they were exposed to the teachings or had heard about Jesus probably through Joseph and remembered all of that. Stuff. Yeah, I, I think at some point uh, there has to be some connection with this God because who is telling him to kill the babies? And first of all, look at, the, look at the, what the request is. Kill babies. If somebody's going to tell you to kill babies, that's not someone you want to cross. Because they would have no reservation about killing you, all right? They don't, they don't value life. And they don't value the life of a baby to kill that baby. They're not going to value your life. So I think it probably had to be some connection that they had seen how God operates. It could have been that they just saw how much God was blessing them through all of this. And they said, this is their livelihood, right? This is what they do. They deliver babies. And they say, given the situation with how much hard work they're doing, not just that they're in good shape, but they are driven to the point daily of almost dying, right? That's not good for childbirth. And yet this God keeps blessing these women. I've never, I mean, from her perspective, I've never seen anything like this before. I mean, I've been around delivering babies all my life. I've never seen anything like this you develop probably a strong relationship with people through this process, and you know you're you're maybe checking up on them throughout the time. Somehow, some way, she knew this, and this is huge. She knew who she should fear in this equation. Do I fear the God of the Hebrews, or do I fear the most powerful man in all the world who has just told me to kill babies? That's not an easy choice, unless she really knew who God was, I don't think anything else would have made her do this, right? Jeff? This may be restating some of what you said, but um, uh, these women were, their job was to safely bring babies into the world. So asking them to, to do the opposite of what their job was, be like telling a doctor, kill anybody that comes to you that's sick. Just, just kill them. You know, there's no use having them on this earth, just kill them. That's, that's completely contrary to what a doctor, his purpose in life is. And so, uh, you know, that could have been part of, part of their, um, besides the fearing of God. Oh, you're asking about the life experiences. So yeah. their experience is, that's what we do. We bring them into the world. And now you're asking me to kill them. I just can't do that. Yeah. So that's my thought. If you're doing, I mean, we, sometimes we think scientists should have the best grasp that there's a God, right? And if she sees daily what birth is like and how everything works, she had to know some, someone is in charge of that, some being is in charge of that. And having the relationship with the Hebrew women and having all the, if, if she was Egyptian, knowing the gods of the Egyptians, eh, no, they're not, they don't, that's not where it's at. It's at the, the God of the Hebrew. Now, if she's Hebrew, then it, it just takes it to a, an, maybe an easier level of understanding who God is. Randy? Yeah, that was pretty much. Okay. That was pretty much where I was going. They've spent all this, I, you know, even if they were Egyptian, they spent all this time with these Hebrews, you know, getting to know them and seeing how their God affects their people and how these Egyptian gods maybe affect the Egyptians. And they're seeing a huge difference here. Yeah. And like, that sounds like a big God. The gods are way different, right? They're getting, these can't be real. This one has to be real. Scott, and then we'll have to move on. Yeah, I was going to say, Brian pretty much nailed it, I think, uh, being probably Hebrew women, and uh, they feared God. Uh, that and Jeff kind of got my thoughts there. They were 
there to save lives, to um, help babies be delivered, not to kill them. And uh, so pretty much uh, they had to do what their conscience you know, uh, wanted them to do. Yeah. They didn't fear the king. Yeah. Uh, to me, or whoever. The, the key is in a text, right? It says because they feared God. All right, so that, that has to be the key reason why they didn't kill the babies, because that's what it, the text says. Why they feared God more than Pharaoh, you know, you could, you could try to reason that through, which I think is an interesting thing to reason, which we've, we've just done. So I, I think there's a, there's, there's a lot of things to think about regarding that. But the, the main reason is that they feared God. And like, like we'll, we'll talk about in a little while, you take these three people, they would be at the top of the list of the meanest, most evil people that you have in the Bible, right? You have Ahab backed up by Jezebel, and God says that he's done more to turn people away from God than any other king before him. He wasn't afraid to kill somebody for his vineyard, whatever the case may be, right? He was ruthless. You have Athaliah, and she's about as bad as they get, right? You, you, you'd have a hard time finding anybody in the Bible more evil than she. And then Pharaoh, you know, he's a guy that, and I find it interesting, whatever convinced these ladies that God was worth fearing over Pharaoh didn't convince Pharaoh, right? It took a lot more to convince Pharaoh. It took all these 10 plagues, and he still didn't get it. And so I think that's all interesting as well. Anything about, what about Jehoshabeth? Uh, what, what do you think some of the things that in her life that may have made her ready for this? There's the, sort of the family chart. You see how that goes. What would have made her ready for this? All right, Mary, Nancy has something up here. Well, she was married to a priest, which is, is, seems unusual because, because back in when the priesthood was formed, it, it seemed as if priests married Levite women. So that was unusual, and considering her relatives as well, how, how um, heretical they were, and I also read that Athaliah may have been her, her stepmother rather than her yes, mother. Yes, that's, that's possible. Most things that I read said probably her mother, but I, I, I don't know. It was I don't another know. It wife. Doesn't say. It doesn't say. It says we don't that know, she, right? Yeah, it doesn't mm -hmm. say. It says she's the daughter but of, of the husband, but not the, not the wife. So we don't know for sure. Nancy? Oh, who has it? Um, Mary actually said what Nancy okay. was going right. to say, so she. Has All right. <laughs> yeah, I mean, she married she married a guy that that really would have helped her, grounded her in this, and would have been giving her very good advice to go along with this. I think that's huge. I think growing up with Athaliah as your mother, that wouldn't have been good, right? Do you think? Do you just think being around her evil all the time and her uh, her deceit, her conniving just the way that she is, you think there was probably some resentment there, especially since she has this good pull from her husband over here, shining a light, just how bad her mother really is. If it's her stepmother, then that would probably even add to that equation. So I think that's one thing that has to be involved in who she is. She would have known the promises of Abraham. She would have known the promise to David, which is closer to her in history and more important to her through, through her lineage and the, and the ones that God made. She would have seen all of the death that has already been there in, in the previous two generations, been known about that, and know that that's not where she wants to go uh, at all. Anything about Obadiah that would have made him ready? He was over the king's household. He may have been there when Elijah pronounced the, fat, the, the drought three years earlier. So he, he would have had that. He would have, there would have been a lot of things that were there. And it says that he feared God from his childhood. So he had a good foundation from even being a child. So... What, uh, what character traits do we see in these three people that are worth emulating? All right, Debbie has one up here. I'll let her have, maybe she takes the low-hanging fruit here. Oh, <clears throat> well, I just said that um, as far as ship, really caring they were kind they were obedient to God and you're not giving in to a command or a law or dictate that would disobey God's word okay so they were obedient they were faithful to the to the to God Jehoshaphat I said shrewd and brave because he hit all those 
priests in the cave and had okay. to provide for them. He was generous. I don't know. It, it was a famine. I don't know where he got food to provide for 100 people. You know, so he was really right. a sharp, a very sharp, thoughtful, br brave we, person. <laughs> we talked a little bit about that with Eleazar, right? If mm -hmm. Eleazar was Abraham's servant that went and got Isaac's wife, just how... How, how well he planned, how shrewd he was, how wide he was in carrying out that plan. Oh, I think Obadiah is the same way. That he, he's feeding 100 people during a famine just with bread and water, but he's keeping them alive. Some suggest that Ahab may have known about this and just turned a blind eye to it. Jezebel probably did not know about that. She wouldn't have turned a blind eye. But there is some wisdom and some shrewdness in that that we can emulate in our life just by being, being wise. Who, okay. Uh, decisiveness. All three are against the odds, to say the least, uh, in their, their given situations from what we see. Uh, all three are standing up to, forced to being, uh, forced to stand up to very powerful people. Um, and although, in uh, especially Obadiah and uh, Shifra and Pua's case, clearly there's some kind of hesitation, there is some difficulty because they're trying to maneuver, you know, and, and survive, you know, that's an understandable trait. But all three of them ultimately make the right decision. They, they're, they're not trying to compromise with evil things that are being done to them. They're not trying to compromise with uh, the, the, the difficult situations that they're in any more than they have to. Uh, they are ultimately determined to and, and have decided on performing God's right, So determined, not, not, not compromising, and so just uh, willing to stand up even in the difficult times. So mm -hmm. you used another word there. I can't remember what it was. Decisive. Now. Decisive. Yeah, that was the first word. So decisive, determined, not wanting to compromise at all with this. Now, I, I think you bring up a good point in, in all of this. They knew the possible consequences it reminds me a little bit of Daniel, right? Daniel knew the decree had been signed. He knew the consequence of doing what he was going to do was going to be thrown in the lion's den. So they knew that there was a, a real consequence. This wasn't like, oh, he'd never do this. She'd never, she'd never kill me. Yeah, she would. Okay, yes, they, you're, you're in jeopardy in doing this. And that really, uh, I don't think they hesitated because of that. I think it shows more courage that they went into that, making that decision, knowing very well what the result might be. That might cost me my life in doing this, but I'm going to do it anyway. Just like Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, Daniel, so many other bigger characters in the Bible that we have. But I think she has, they have all have the same character trait. Well, the one that is obvious is fearing God, right? All of them fear God. And you don't do what you, you do, you know, take your life in your own hand unless you fear God. Job feared God. Cornelius feared God. Specifically stated, he, he was a person who feared God. And I think what we learn from this, this is what fearing God looks like. It's willing to do whatever he says regardless of the consequences. Right? He deserves to be obeyed. He, he's powerful enough to help us, and, and he will help us no matter what, whether it's the way we want to be helped or not. As like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said, I think looking at these stories, we see men and women who fear God. As a matter of fact, in Deuteronomy chapter 6, Go ahead and turn over Deuteronomy chapter 6, just to show you how important this concept of fearing God is. It's mentioned three times in chapter 6 of Deuteronomy. It's mentioned twice in chapter 10, chapter 14, chapter 17, chapter 31, this idea of fearing God. It, it, I guess if Moses could get one thing across to them, you fear God. It's sort of like loving God with all your heart, mind, and soul, loving neighbors yourself. It's this, this summation statement and this summation statement is, you fear God. If you fear God, all these other things are going to take care of themselves. Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 2 says, that you, may, uh, that you may fear the Lord your God to keep all His statutes and His commandments, which I command you, you and your sons and your grandsons, all the day of your life, and that your days may be prolonged. Therefore, hear, O Israel, and be careful to observe it, that it may be well with you and your family. You may multiply greatly as the Lord God of our, your fathers has promised you, a lamb flowing with milk and honey. And verse 13, again, you shall fear the Lord your God and serve Him. And it, it goes on, you go down to verse 24, and the Lord commanded us to observe all these statutes, to fear the Lord our God for our good always. If you fear God, what are you going to do about obeying? If you have a healthy respect for God, and you really understand who he is and who we are, it's going to help you 
observe all the commandments, right? And do exactly what he says. I think that's just a huge thing that we can learn from them and learning to fear God. I put that they were willing to take bold action, sort of go what Stephen was talking about. They were not, they were not afraid to take a bold action, to, to defy a king or a queen or a, uh, a king in, in the face of possible uh, killing of your own life. They were willing to take on some long-term commitments to do this, right? You take a baby, now you might have nurses and stuff that could take care of that baby, but she had a nurse with her, but you still, you're sort of taking on a responsibility longer than just this immediate take them and put them in that room and let somebody else take care of them. You're taking on a responsibility there. The, uh, Obadiah was taking on the priest, I mean the prophets. He didn't know how long that was going to take. He didn't know how long the family was going to be there. He, he could have been at, into this job for a long time. And he wasn't worried about that long-term commitment that he was taking on. Any other lessons from these three minor characters that you'd like to bring on? Right, Mary has another one. I just wanted to mention in Jehoshaphat's case, she was patient because, because after um, they took on this child, that there were six more years of, of Athaliah's reign and, and all the violence and... Uh, you know, ungodliness of that. She she was patient. And yeah, patient and wise. I right. mean, to know, hey, you know, it's not time now. Let's just wait till the time. And her husband had a lot to do with that. He was the one that made the plan to bring it about when it was the, the right time. So there had to be some wisdom in, involved in when is the time right to bring him out, say that he's king, do all the anointing, and we know Athaliah is not going to take this line down, right? And so there was careful planning with all the people involved. You do this, you do this, you do this. This is how we're going to handle this. Yes, ma'am. Talk in the microphone. <laughs> there are people I have studied with who adamantly oppose the, the use of the word fear. When you say fear God, I, I don't want to know a God that I have to fear. I understand it, but would you take a minute and just explain kind of what that means? Yeah, I think it's a healthy respect for, and in some ways, it, you, knowing who he is, what he has done, what he continues to do for us, that healthy respect, and with enough fear to help you, motivate you to do what is right. That, there's nothing wrong with fearing God, and even the way that your, that your friends might view this. I, I think the greatest way for me to understand it is with my dad, right? You know, I, I respected my dad. I, was, I didn't live in fear of my dad. You know, he's going to come in and randomly just start pouncing on me one day, right? <laughs> but I knew that my dad, when he said something, he meant business, and that I should do that, right? And I respected him enough to do it, you know, most of the time. <laughs> Sometimes I didn't. And I paid the, concept, paid the price for that. So I think it's a healthy respect is how I would think of it. And then, you know, you could probably talk to them a little bit about it. They had a good relationship with their mother and their father, you know. And as that relationship develops and you get older, there's not an obedient thing that you don't have to obey your parents as much anymore when you're older, but you still have that healthy respect and fear for them as, as you're older, right? Even when you're on your own and making your own money and doing your own things, and make, you still have that respect for your, your parents. I added a question here. You guys have time to think about this. We'll have to, we don't have really a lot of time to talk about this. I just want you to think about this when, you, when you're studying these stories. What kind of influence did they have? I have a whole series of lessons that are called history-changing prayers. Sometimes somebody does something in history that doesn't, they're not trying to change history. They're just trying to save a life, and that has ramifications that go a lot farther than their life. And so, obviously, they saved some babies. <laughs> that was helpful, and that was good for those babies and those families. Uh, they had their own families as a result of this. Without this, they may not have had their own families. God blessed them with families. Um, Joash and the entire lineage there was protected up to Christ. And it definitely made a difference for those hundred prophets that they saved. All right, did you have your hand up, Herb? Uh, you said about Joash. Okay. Yeah, the, the line to Christ. Uh, yeah. Hanging by a thread. You know, the whole, the whole promise, hanging by a thread, if you will. Not knowing anything, learning, I'm sure they're learning a lot through there, which we'll talk a little bit about Sunday, at Sunday about the importance of learning in that first six years of your life. Okay, what practical lessons can we learn from these minor characters? What can you take away? What can they teach you? And how can you implement it in your life? 
All right, Nancy has one up here. Will, go ahead. You can talk on your way. Or sure. Send Brian with a microphone. You talk. Uh, it's always hard, you know, today as Christians to know how to, if, if the government or if our leaders, you know, we have verses like in Titus chapter 3 that talk about how we respect our, uh, you know, the authorities and leaders, but we also know that God, we, we need to fear God too. So I just think these are good examples here because they didn't revolt, that there wasn't any aggression here. There wasn't kind of this reckless uh, revolt against these wicked rulers. In all situations, they were hiding someone so it would have required a major lifestyle change right. especially jehoshaphat for six years seven years but it was all done diligently you know in a way peaceably uh, but it was still a, a major revolt against something that was against god yeah so i mean we learn it all through scripture right if you're if you're forced if you have a choice to obey god or obey people you always obey god over people right and it, it, if you have a healthy fear for god you will nancy i would just say protect the helpless Yes, I think that that's a huge lesson that we can learn in our life, especially two of these examples have to do with children, right? It's okay to be pro-life, okay? It's okay to be against killing babies in the womb. And as Amen. Christians, we need to be stand up for that. I mean, these people are willing to list, risk their life to protect a small number of children. And so they weren't, what we're afraid of, we're afraid of being canceled. You know, we're afraid of ridicule. We're afraid of stuff like that. They were afraid for their life. And this brings uh, to this one point, and then we'll get to you, Herb, that I want to make sure I get to is God spells out his, what he wants from us in his word very well, right? And that's where we go to find out what God wants. As we know God better, we are able to determine whenever two things seem to be in conflict, what God would want you to do. And that happens as you get to know God better. You know, these people knew that God would want them to save life. And so they chose that instead of following them. So I just think that's a huge lesson. The more and more we get to know God and we get to stay, with, with these new things that come out of left field that we've never heard of before, never done before, and we don't know, there's not really a specific application, specifically mentioned in the Bible, we know what the like is in the, in, the, in, the fruit, in the rest of the flesh, right? Because we know God and His character. So the better we know God and His character, the more we're going to be able to know what God would want us to do in certain circumstances where it might not be as spelled out as we'd like for it to be. Herb? Well, that's perfect what I was going to say. The people that you were talking about, and you said, no God, the people they were instructing to do things, they had to have the integrity and the character to be known by these people so that people would trust them. As he was saying, you know, you go here and you go there and I'm gonna feed you here. They already had to have the integrity and a life that said, I'm gonna keep my word and I'm doing the right thing or else the people wouldn't have trusted them. Yeah. So we learned that they knew God and the people knew that they knew God. Yeah, absolutely. And even, even with Obadiah and Ahab, Obadiah, you don't work yourself up to be the king's right hand man unless you are a person that can get things done and do things correctly. Now, sometimes to get there, people compromise their integrity, right? To get to those power, those, those positions of power, Obadiah didn't, right? He, he did what was right regardless of what was going to happen next. So I think there are a lot of other things that we can learn here. And I, I put question six ahead of that because I think that was probably the most important one. We're going to be faced maybe in our lifetime with decisions do I do what God wants or do I do what, do what government wants or do I do what my boss wants All right I have an example down here you can ring the bell I have an example down here where a, a university professor refused to call someone by the pronoun of their choice he was willing to compromise I will just call them by their name I will not call them any pronoun I'll just call them by their name that wasn't good enough they wanted to be referred to as a particular pronoun he says I can't do it I will just call them by their last name because now it's a different first name. I'll just call them by their last name. No, it's not good enough. They ended up disciplining him, put a thing in his file that he's, he was not cooperating. He, he fought against that. Uh, and, and he actually ended up winning in the court. Uh, that he, he, didn't, he didn't have to do that. It was a violation of his free speech to call somebody by the, by the right pronoun or the, or the wrong pronoun. And you have the football coach who recently just got his job back because the Supreme Court said that he, can't, he can say the prayer. 
You have all these other things that instead of fearing people and being canceled, let's just fear God and let's do what God wants. Do it kindly. Don't do it in a, in a hateful, ugly way. Uh, but sometimes people aren't going to accept your willingness to compromise. They're going to want it their way. And if that violates our conscience, then we just can't do it. We've got we to gotta put God first. We've got to do what God wants. And that is going to come up more and more, I think, as time goes by.